Friendship has fallen on hard times, hasn't it? Presbyterian pastor and and author Scott Saul certainly thinks so and has made this case in his recent book called Befriend, Belonging in an Age of Judgment, Isolation, and Fear. He notes that there are three particularly hollow kinds of friendship that have either popped up or become very prominent here in the 21st century. First, there are digital friendships. Those are relationships that only exist in the limited constraints of social media. Everything happens not in person, face-to-face, but behind computer or phone screens. Secondly, he talks about transactional friendships. These are relationships that only use people as a means to an end. In other words, there's no sincere affection or care for a person. Instead, you're friends with someone only to advance a career or build a platform or or maybe gain access to new social circles or or to increase your own self-esteem. So there's digital friendships, transactional friendships, and third and finally, he says there's also one-dimensional friendships. Maybe this is probably, I would think, the most common. These are relationships that are based only on perhaps one shared interest and not much else. Now, maybe that shared interest could be a good thing, a hobby, or uh, knowing something in common, but maybe it can be less so. Maybe it's on kind of an extreme political position. Maybe it's a shared hatred for a person or philosophy. Maybe that friendship is built only on something negative and unhealthy. Now, these less real friendships that are so common in our day and age suffer from a lack of richness because they are not friendships that are forged in the fires of vulnerability and mutual suffering. Real friendships grow and even the toughest places, to allow people to become strong and loyalty and love together. But the kind of friendships that we hear talked about now, the kind of friendships that um, we find so common are these shallow friendships that are rooted in small things, withering things. Now Saul goes on to say, real friends not only agree, but disagree. Real friends not only applaud each other's strength, but challenge each other's weakness. Real friends not only enjoy life together, but struggle through life together. Real friends not only praise one another, but apologize and forgive one another. See, in our day and age, with all these faults and faux friendships and shallow acquaintances, perhaps nothing could be more encouraging to us as Christians than to see what real friendship looks like. To experience it for ourselves. A fellowship forged by the Gospel. And this is not just simply a relationship that's built on doctrine or theory even though doctrine's a good thing. But these are relationships that are built on action and practice and consistency. And so Paul, a true friend of the Philippians, reminds this suffering congregation, he reminds them of two more good and godly friends that they have, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now these friends he mentions are not fair-weather friends. They're not people that only show up when the going is good. In fact, we're about to see that when things are tough, even on these people personally, not just the Philippians, but when it's tough on Timothy, when it's tough on Epaphroditus, still they're friends. And so this morning, before we get into this topic, I think it's so crucial for our day and age for what real Christian friendship and fellowship looks like, let's just remind ourselves of of where we've been. Now, it's been a couple of weeks since we've been in Philippians together. And so, just as a quick review, this letter to the Philippian church is a letter that Paul was writing while under house arrest. Most likely, although we don't know for sure, most likely in the city of Rome. 
He's writing to the Philippians, which are a congregation of, of Eastern European Christians in Macedonia. That's a province that would be east of Rome and a little bit north of Greece. So they're Eastern European Christians. And, and this province in Macedonia, and specifically in Philippi, is, a, uh, is an outpost of the Roman Empire where lots of military heroes go to retire. And early on in our series, I compared it to kind of a Langley, Virginia, except for Rome. Now, these new Christians, that is the Philippian church, have shrugged off their old life and their old culture and their old way. See, in the city of Philippi, there was a big culture of, of greed and a domineering spirit and a pride in its militarism and even its brutality. But they've shrugged all that off for a new life in Jesus. A subversive, countercultural, radical life of love, of unity, of compassion and generosity. Now, they have so shaken up their identity, because their identity has been so shaken up in Jesus that they're suffering for it. That they're being persecuted and pushed back against. So Paul is writing this letter, this loving, gentle letter, to encourage them to keep on doing the good work that they're already doing. To keep on in the good work that God has started in them and has promised, no matter how tough things get in their daily life, He'll bring it. To completion. Now he's already given them, and this is the core of the letter, he's already given them Jesus as their prime example. Not only is Jesus the one whom they worship, Jesus is the center of all reality. Jesus is the only holy and glorious one, but he shows them how they, now transported into the life of Christ, can live like Jesus and be like Jesus and his humility and love, and grace. And so he hopes they'll continue in the trajectory that Jesus has started for them. That is, to be a kind of people that are um, a, a people of love. A, and a, not just a love that's, you know, a, a shallow, oh man, I love McDonald's. Oh man, I love cable news. That kind of thing. I, but, but love that is sincere. Love that is self-giving and love that is neighbor-loving. And so now, after he's given them Jesus as the prime example, he's giving them two more practical examples in Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now, Timothy and Epaphroditus are just like them. They're normal people. They're two forgiven sinners, two ordinary citizens. And in these two, he's hoping to encourage them in Jesus Christ to be friends with one another to the end. And so, that's what brings us to our first section here today. Let's look at these first uh, five verses together. Verses 19-24. through 24. Now, the first example he gives of this kind of friendship is Timothy. Now, he says he hopes, he hopes not in circumstances, He hopes not in his own clever plans or schemes, but rather he says he hopes in the Lord Jesus. The surest foundation you can put your hope in. He hopes in the Lord Jesus that he can send Timothy on a round trip to Philippi so he can be encouraged by Timothy's report on how this church is doing. Paul is assuming they're going to receive his letter and act on it accordingly to obey the, the, the wisdom that he's given them that's come down on high from Jesus. And so he's expecting that Timothy will go to this church and see that they've received Paul's letter and responded to it by growing in love for one another, in trust in Jesus Christ. And Paul's even willing to forego the immediate comforts of Timothy's presence and his imprisonment, even for months on end. Think of this from Paul's perspective. He's in prison. He's under house arrest. He's surrounded by guards that despise him, that think little of him. They probably aren't taking the best care of him. In fact, the only relief, physical reliefs and comforts 
that he's getting, the creature comforts we might say, is from patrons, from churches sending gift baskets and maybe small amounts of medicine and wine and things that would help his stomach or his, his head or if he's hurting. He's not receiving this from the Roman Empire. So here he is in isolation and Timothy is there to help him and he's willing to forgo having Timothy be there by his side if it means that Timothy can go to the Philippians and bring back news of how this beloved little church, just like Paul, is keeping on, keeping on. When things are tough, when things are difficult, the thing that Paul needs more than even someone at his side is the knowledge that Christians that he loves, even far away, that are struggling like him, are still continuing on in the faith. Doesn't it encourage you? That's why when we have missionaries come here to our church and we hear the reports of what God is doing around the world, isn't it encouraging to you? Maybe it doesn't even feel like your spiritual life has been that great this week, but to hear what God is doing and people that you love far away is an encouragement to you. It, it rekindles your own faith. I'm convinced that's what Paul is hoping for here. But here's what I think is really especially interesting about this. It's not just what Paul feels, but what Timothy does too. Because it's not only Paul that loves the Philippians, but Timothy loves them as well. In fact, Timothy is a flesh and blood example of the kind of Christian character that Paul hopes the Philippians will grow into. Now, I think he thinks that they're either almost there or are or, or, or there and just need uh, to be strengthened and confirmed in that work. But he uses Timothy, I think, as an example of what he hopes that everybody at the church of Philippi might be like. In verse 20, he calls Timothy like-minded. Now, he means that in such a way, not just doctrinally, but like-minded in such a way that no one else no one will care about their interest like he will. So when he talks about Timothy being like-minded, that is a like-mindedness with action behind it. So often in our day and age, in our various evangelical circles, whether we're Baptists or Presbyterian, whether we're Calvinist or Arminian, whether we're high church or low church, whether we're contemporary or traditional, we think of like-minded as being that we adhere to just a certain set of doctrines and beliefs, and that's it. But the like-mindedness that Paul talks about is a like-mindedness that compels to action and love. See, Timothy is not just like-minded in what he believes about who Jesus is, what he believes about the missionary work being empowered by the Spirit. He's like-minded in the sense that he will put these Christians that he also loves, he'll put their interests before his own. That's what real like-mindedness looks like. Like-mindedness, I think, has the connotation of being not only like-minded, but like-hearted. I know a lot of people that I think theologically I would agree with about the doctrines that they teach and believe. How they would say the Bible on certain matters, what it really means, how to properly interpret that. But I know a lot of people that I would agree with that I would not get along with very well because I've seen maybe some selfish qualities in them or I've seen how that uh, being a, a good Christian just means to be theologically pure, to have intellectual pursuits and have no love or compassion for the local church or for the, the neighbors to whom we're supposed to be ministering. Like-minded for Paul means that Timothy cares about their interests before he cares about his own, which is what Paul's written about earlier in Philippians chapter 2. But see, what Paul goes on to say is that while Timothy puts their interests before his own, he says that's not what the world normally looks like. He says everyone else does uh, not or, or looks after not the interest of Christ Jesus, but their own interests. I think he's sweeping very broadly when he says this. Whether they're religious or not, the way the world works is that people are interested in their agendas and their priorities and not looking 
for the well-being and the honor of one another. Paul's words in Romans chapter 3 ring out to me here. You remember what he says there after talking about for these three chapters about Jewish people that are been that have grown up under the law and he talks about the pagan Greek people that have been nowhere close to God's covenant. And this is his this is his um assessment of any people group on the planet, whether devoutly religious or you know, kind of wantonly pagan. He says this, whether you're a devout Jewish person or a fervent pagan, whether you're young or old, whether you're male or female, whether you're rich or poor, I would say in our own day and age, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, there is none righteous. No. Not one. No one truly understands the divine mind. No one really seeks after God and His kingdom. The human heart we learn from all over the Scriptures will always choose to glorify itself over glorifying God. We'll always choose to love our own ego and pursuits instead of choosing to love our neighbor. But Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, God with us, has begun to change that in the human race. See, it's nothing that, not, not, uh, there's nothing in the Roman Empire or in the United States of America, there's nothing in us being educated or having a lot of money, there's no scientific advancements, there's no artistic achievements that have made us into a kind of people that would love God and love our neighbor. What Jesus says is the whole of the law. The thing that has achieved that in us is Jesus Christ for us. He's ground zero for us becoming entirely different. See, he's changed that in Paul. Paul was a fierce persecutor of a church. He would have Uh, big brutish soldiers drag women by their hair out through the streets and throw them in prison, lock kids up in prison. That's the kind of person Paul was and his religiosity. And yet, Jesus has changed to where, Jesus has changed Paul in such a way that he'll be in prison if that means that his friends can go free. Paul didn't do that in himself. The Gospel of Jesus Christ did that in Paul. And it does the same thing in the Philippians. And now it's changing the heart of Timothy. And brothers and sisters, this morning, I'd like you to know that the Gospel of Jesus Christ in you, no matter what kind of morning you've had, no matter what kind of week, month, or year, or lifetime you've had, the Gospel of Jesus Christ can do this work in your heart too. See, Timothy, Paul says in verse 22, has proven his character. He stood by Paul's side through thick and thin. He's been a spiritual son to Paul, his spiritual father. He served in gospel ministry, not only as a partner with Paul, but as we've learned earlier in this book, as a partner of God himself, as a partner in his grace and his gospel. See, let's look at just a quick biography of of Timothy. I'll just go over it quickly for us. Timothy rejected the pagan upbringing of his father and instead embraced the godliness, the humility passed down to him by his mother's side of the family, his grandmother Lois, his mother Eunice. He's worked with Paul in Macedonia and Corinth, and he even pastors a congregation in Ephesus. He's helped Paul write 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, Philemon, and even probably scholars think parts of this book too. And although his reputation and his resume precede him, Timothy would put the Philippians' interest above his own always. Even though Paul speaks of him so highly, he's got a reputation all over the, the Roman Empire of being a Christian leader, and yet... Timothy looks after even the least and lowly in the Philippians before he even thinks of himself. See, this is not only what true Christian leadership looks like. I would go even further to say, this is what true Christian discipleship looks like even in people who are not leaders. Every Christian leader should look like this. 
But every Christian period can look like this. To be humble, to love, and to produce steadfast unity. And so Paul plans to send this Timothy as soon as he can spare him. And in verse 24, he's confident in the Lord that this friend that he's sending will precede his own return to Philippi so he can minister to them as well. So here comes Timothy to the Philippians, a friend to the end. Now let's talk about this next person that Paul has mentioned. Not just Timothy, but Epaphroditus. Now Paul has already sent another friend to them. The very one who delivered and read and explained this letter, Epaphroditus is his name. In verse 25, Paul says it was necessary to send him, that is Epaphroditus, and he gives them these honorariums. He says, his brother, his co-worker, and I'm convinced he uses this last term, fellow soldier, because that would make sense to them in this uh, military outpost. But he's not just saying that he's a you know fellow soldier of the Roman Empire. What Paul is really saying is that Epaphroditus is his brother and gospel arms. See, just like Paul, who was suffering imprisonment, and just like Timothy, who was prioritizing the Philippians' well-being over his own, so comes Epaphroditus, a true friend to these people. And just like Timothy, and just like Paul, Epaphroditus bears some esteem. See, Paul calls him a messenger. That's the word we read here in the CSB. But the the original Greek word is the word for apostle. And so Paul calls him uh, an apostle. The same term he uses for Silas, or Silvanus as he's sometimes called. The same term he uses for Apollos, and Barnabas, and Junia. These brothers and sister appointed by the Lord to come bearing the good news of the gospel. That's a high duty and honor to be called a messenger or an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. These people have one particular duty, and it is to come and give a gospel reminder that Jesus Christ is King over all. And in His faithful righteousness, the people are free to come and to feast at His table. That's the message that these apostles get to bear. Now, Paul sees Epaphroditus as an equal, putting him uh, on level playing ground with this apostolic task. And yet, in verse 26, we read that he has been longing for the Philippians, and even more than that, he has been distressed because they've been distressed. So here he is... uh, 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 a well-known preacher and pastor and perhaps bishop in the early Christian church. And yet, and he's been going through some kind of sickness, and yet the worst thing to him has not been his own sickness, but the fact that, that they've been distressed about his sickness. Now, this is not just a minor cold he's going through or a simple stomach bug, Paul says that whatever Epaphroditus had, it almost killed him. He was on death's door. And yet his concern was not even for his own health first. It was for how the Philippians are taking the news that he's unwell. That's pretty incredible, I think. Whenever I've been really sick, I'm not thinking about how any of you might feel about how I'm feeling. I'm thinking about me. And yet, what the Gospel has done in Epaphroditus has made it to where his heart breaks, not for himself when he's at a disadvantage, but for others. And yet, through all that, the Scriptures tell us, he, like Timothy, is so much more interested in their good. That he was more upset, that they were upset that he was dying. Now that Maranatha, I'm convinced, is not the way of the world. Nobody can live like that through sheer religious force of will. No, that kind of spirit, that kind of attitude, that kind of action is the life of Jesus Christ worked out in us for the sake of one another. I can almost hear this next part through Paul's happy tears. He said, while this world only had death for Epaphroditus, however... God 
had mercy on him. Not only on him, but Paul says, God had mercy on me. By sparing Epaphroditus' life, he spared me sorrow upon sorrow. And by extension, he's had mercy on you, Philippians, because he has spared you of the sorrow of losing him. And for all these reasons, that Epaphroditus is longing to serve them as their apostle, that he is in his deathly sickness, healed by God, that he was distressed and they're distressed. For those reasons, verse 28, Paul has eagerly sent Epaphroditus to them so they can rejoice in his presence and his ministry. So they can be less anxious And he can be less anxious about this beloved brother and friend. And so Paul says, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and invite him into the fellowship and happily feast with him and all who must be honored like him. Treat this servant and every servant you see come in the name of the Lord with high honor because they come to serve you. They've laid aside their own uh, their own interests, their own conveniences, their own ambitions for your sake. Remember in all this too, Christ came to serve us all humbly, meekly, taking on all our troubles and sorrows all our weaknesses and sins in Himself on the cross so that perishing with Him under God's wrath and justice, instead He might shed mercy on all who believe. This is what the true Christian friendship is to look like. It looks like conforming oneself to Christ's own life. A life that was always loving a life that was always serving, a life that was always giving for the good of not himself, but for the one to whom he's given. And so as Timothy has risked his life, as Paul sits in prison, and so now in verse 30, Epaphroditus has come close to death for his work in Christ. So can we, in turn, befriend one another in this way. See, that's the marvelous thing, I think, about what the New Testament shows us. Is that any ordinary person, no matter what their background, no matter their sins, no matter their age or education, any person who comes to the Lord Jesus and receives His Gospel can live a life just like this. It's not meant for super saints. It's not meant for only the the cream of the crop of the church throughout the centuries to be saints. No, this is a life that is reserved for all of us so that we can take the risk to make ourselves vulnerable knowing that our life truly is hidden safe with Christ on high. And Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus and even in the Philippians, we see examples of true friendship and fellowship. But it's not always easy to be a good friend or to be a Christian in this way. It takes real responsibility. It takes real sacrifice to live this way. In his well-known book, The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis captures the heart of true friendship. I think perhaps marvelously more than anybody in the 20th or maybe even the 21st century. He says this, to love at all as a friend, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping your heart intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Not even a pet, he said. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. And void any entanglements. Lock your heart up in a safe, in a casket or a coffin of your own selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. 
It will not be broken, but it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. We can live in this world in such a way where we lock our hearts away in a coffin of selfishness and greed and ego to where the only thing we care about is our hobbies, our luxuries, our convenience, our comfort. And we'll find that when we put our heart in a coffin like that, what is inside is a dead, stony thing. Totally unable to experience the sublime joys of love. The sublime realities of the Gospel. But to be a Christian, to be a true friend, is to see that Jesus Christ Himself came into this world and vulnerability as a baby born into the poor backwoods of a, a little insignificant country to grow up working a, a, a tradesman's job so that he could go out not with great wealth or education, but go out in the name and authority of God and love and heal and forgive and ultimately die for the sins of many. That is what true Christian love and friendship looks like. Scott Sauls, the, the pastor that I mentioned earlier, says there you have it. Real love, real friendship is vulnerable and risky and costly and discomforting and disquieting and it agitates like sandpaper sometimes. To be a Christian then, I realize what I'm asking this morning. To be a Christian is to seek to be this kind of a friend. One who does open themselves up to heartache, to heartbreak, to suffering. But in opening yourselves up in that way, what you're finding is that you are joining your hearts to Jesus Christ's own heart, who loved and suffered for each of us so that we could be real friends with Him. And we, in turn, can be like that for one another. Folks, this is not self-willed. We don't come up with the power to do this on our own. We don't come up with a plan to do it on our own. It's in Christ that we fill up what, we ch what each other are lacking, as Paul says in the last verse. Through His sacrifice on the cross for us, where God vowed to be our friend forever, we can in turn freely befriend one another. And so as we come to this table today, a table that is a symbol of God's friendship with us, you don't eat with anybody but friends. As we come to this table today, a table of friendship and fellowship forged on the rough wood of the cross, let's remember that Christ's broken body and blood have been laid out for us. So let us come as friends and friends with Him to the end. Let's pray. Lord, as we come now to Your holy table with testimonies of Your love and faithfulness, help us to come intent on obedience. Obedience to love. Obedience to forgive as we have been loved and forgiven by Jesus. For it's in His name that we now ask and pray all these things. Amen.